Thank you, Peter. My goodness, how can I follow that? Thank you so much, Cathy and Sue, to your families. We're so incredibly proud of you, and we're so lucky to have you as well. So, so huge thanks. Wow, that was, that was incredible. Um, so I'm Catherine Taylor. I'm the regulatory manager on the Fresh and Balanced programme. And in terms of the tobacco side of the programme, my particular areas of interest are around illicit tobacco and most recently around vaping. Um, as well as working really closely with public health colleagues, I work closely with trading standards, with licensing, environmental health, HMRC, and the police, and a, a, a wide array of other enforcement and regulatory partners. So what I want to do is to spend the next 15 minutes or so just outlining to you what an effective regulatory landscape would look like to help achieve the 5% vision that we're all working towards. And I'll do this by outlining where regulations have brought us to this far, the importance of price as a lever, why and how we need to address illicit tobacco in terms of reducing supply but also demand, what is missing from our regulatory framework for tobacco, but also what about other nicotine products as well, particularly those that don't contain tobacco, the importance of regulation at all levels, um, and hopefully leaving you with the key message that we need to ensure that the most harmful products, i.e. tobacco, are the ones that are the most tightly regulated. So we know that tobacco is the most lethal consumer product on the market that's out there, and we've heard from speakers today about the incredible damage that it inflicts on our communities, and we need to bear this in mind when we're thinking about a proportionate approach and what a future regulatory landscape will look like. And at the international level, we have the World Health Organization Framework Convention on tobacco control. Um, it's, you know, it was the, the world's first public health um, global treaty, and the UK is obviously a party to that treaty. Um, and its objective really is to protect people from tobacco-related harm. And it basically provides a framework for action in terms of protecting people from um, the harms of tobacco, um, including reducing secondhand smoke exposure. And on the whole, and certainly in relation to some of our um, some other countries, the UK is pretty strong in terms of its implementation. We do have comprehensive legislation in place around some of the P's that were mentioned earlier. We have high tobacco prices, thanks to a strong tax regime, we have standardised packaging, we've remo removed most forms of tobacco advertising and promotion, including displays at the point of sale. We have smoke-free laws regulating the places where tobacco can and can't be smoked, and we have laws in place around the product itself, although I'm sure you'll agree there are, there's room in all of these for, for improvement. The tobacco industry is largely kept at bay in terms of its impact in the policymaking arena, thanks to really good compliance with Article 5.3 of the FCTC in terms of keeping the tobacco industry out of policy making, but we know that this is still far from perfect and their influence can still certainly be felt in certain sectors. And we're pretty confident that we've got good compliance as a, as a society as a whole in terms of some of these regulations. And as Andy pointed out earlier, we've got really, really good levels of public support um, in terms of these regulations. And the vast majority of the public want the government to do more around smoking. So turning then to the importance of price as a policy lever, and the evidence is really, really clear in terms of price, it encourages quitting, it reduces uptake, and because it has the biggest impact in terms of the most price sensitive people, we know it is a proven effective measure in terms of reducing inequalities, and ultimately it does save lives. And we do have high tobacco prices in the UK, certainly compared to some other countries, and it's Really easy, but not quite true, to say that increasing tobacco prices will drive an illicit tobacco market. But it's actually been shown that in countries where tobacco prices are really low, they, not only do they have high smoking rates, but they also have an active illicit tobacco market. And that's because price isn't the only factor. Other key things like whether there's a strong anti-smuggling strategy in place, whether there's corruption at, um, at the government, and how influential the, the tobacco industry is. And I think we're pretty strong across all of those measures in, in terms of having a strong strategy in place. So we will always continue to advocate for high prices for tobacco, despite the industry's attempts to undermine all of this and to scaremonger around it. But there is still room for improvement, particularly in terms of the price at which hand-rolling tobacco can be bought. That's still far too cheap um, in relation to, to, to cigarettes. And of course, all of this does need to be backed up by broader measures to motivate and to support smokers to quit who are maybe triggered by increases in prices. 
And this is why, as part of the FRESH programme, we do have a specific focus on, on illicit tobacco in terms of our broader tobacco control programme, and we can't just be tackling this in isolation of other measures, but to recognise that it undermines pretty much every tobacco control measure going, not only pricing, but also age of sale, around availability, and around packaging as well, and obviously the fact that kids are getting hold of it cheaply and easily in some of our communities is, is a real concern. So this is our strategic approach around illicit tobacco. It's got eight key strands and it has its roots in back in 2007 when we had the World First Summit bringing health and enforcement partners together to tackle illicit tobacco. So it has eight key strands around partnership, engagement, intelligence and enforcement, marketing communications and measuring progress. And it's through this framework that we deliver our Keep It Out campaign, highlighting the fact that kids are getting hold of it, that it is linked to organised crime, that it is keeping smokers hooked. And through this campaign, we invite members of the public to share intelligence if they know where illegal tobacco is being sold in their communities, and that information goes straight through to trading standards. And since we set this up, um, since we set the reporting lined up in, in 2017, we've had about 11,000 reports nationally that, that's going straight through to the enforcement partners that can take action. So not only do we have work at the regional level, but nationally, fresh with partners in Ash, and now tobacco control colleagues in Greater Manchester, and also through the Spectrum Research Consortium, we lead the National Illicit Tobacco Partnership. And we're really fortunate that on a quarterly basis, Fresh chairs calls with HMRC, with the Department of Health, with Office for Health Improvement and Disparities, and also national trading standards to make sure that illicit tobacco stays high on the national agenda as part of our overall broader um, tobacco control approach. So back to broader tobacco regulation then. So what is missing from our approach, not only to reduce illicit tobacco, but also to reduce smoking overall? And we've heard from Deborah and Mary around the key advocacy asks through the all-party parliamentary group on smoking and health, and we very much support um, all of the recommendations that have been put forward in terms of a levy on the tobacco industry, increasing the age of sale for tobacco, tobacco licensing, and it's frankly bizarre that there isn't a licensing scheme in place for the most lethal consumer product, and that's a gap that needs to be closed urgently. Pack inserts, so putting information within cigarette packs to signpost smokers for help to quit, and there's a current consultation on that at the moment, running till the 10th of October. Please do um, respond to that um, and show the government your support, but also considering perhaps dissuasive cigarettes as well. So. Um, individual health warnings being printed on cigarettes as well to make the product itself even less appealing. We think there's still far too many loopholes in place around tobacco. For example, why are menthol cigarillos still available in shops for packs of 10, much cheaper prices than, um, than the packs of 20 uh, normal cigarettes? We need more regulation in terms of how the industry operates, for example, releasing their sales data so that we know exactly what is being sold, in which areas, which brands are being sold, and, and, um, and how our deprived communities are being most targeted. And it was mentioned earlier as well, we want 100% smoke-free pavement licensing, and we know the North East is leading the way in terms of implementing that at a local level, but it absolutely needs to be nationally mandated. And all of this needs to be wrapped up within a, a comprehensive new tobacco control plan with adequate funding. So what about other nicotine-containing products? And I guess it's about remembering the scale of the harm, taking proportionate regulation within the context of the harms of tobacco. And at the end of the day, it is tobacco products that are killing people. So vapes and vaping, as we know, it's a live issue for many of us in the room. And it's really important that we are striking the right balance between supporting quitting, but also protecting young people as well. So Fresh, with the Association of Directors of Public Health Northeast, are supporting high-impact interventions that ASH have been putting forward about putting a tax on disposable e-cigarettes so that they're not so cheaply available, so that the impact on the environment is reduced, that removing in-store promotions we think needs to, be ha needs to happen as a matter of urgency and prohibiting child-friendly packaging and also reminding the government that back in May they pledged to close the loophole around the free distribution of vapes to anyone. So there is an updated ADPH Northeast position statement in place which reflects the evidence base and also the key advocacy asks as well. And there are too many loopholes with other products as well, um, which are nicotine containing but not tobacco containing, for example, nicotine pouches. At the moment, there's no age of sale laws for them. There's no regulations around 
marketing and promotion. And we know a lot of our local authorities have been contacted by agencies working on um, the industry's behalf, um, wanting to, to hand out freebies of these in shopping centres. And I think in the vast majority, if not all cases, those approaches have been turned down because of the inherent risks and also because of the complete lack of regulatory framework. And I think with these products, a lot more independent research is needed uh, to determine where they fit within tobacco um, and certainly not research from the tobacco industry themselves. So back to vaping. So Fresh has been developing a local strategic framework for vaping, similar to what we've done for illicit tobacco. And this is really to kind of support local authorities to take an evidence-based and strategic approach so that the evidence base is disseminated and followed, that strategic partnerships are developed and maintained, that a whole system approach is taken around this issue to encourage quitting, to deliver effective and evidence-based communications in line with the evidence and the key messages that we know work, um, ensuring that there's work around compliance, intelligence and delivering enforcement, which we know trading standards are doing so well currently, around you know, keeping advocacy as part of that local approach as well in, in terms of what's needed for vapes, but also broader tobacco control, actively taking steps to provide the environment because we know that is a really key issue, and collecting and monitoring local data. We'd love to co-produce this framework with local authorities based on the available resources that we have and also making use of the really good best practice in the room. So I'll be picking this up with local alliances um, after this conference and hopefully we'll be able to work together on developing that framework. So regulatory activity at all levels is really, really important from the global FCTC through to what is done at the local authority level, and we're really, really fortunate in the Northeast and in this region that we have committed, passionate, dedicated regulatory colleagues working in partnership at the local level through local tobacco control alliances, and, and I know many of you are in the room today. We've got engagement with retailers because at the end of the day, they support tobacco regulation. They know that tobacco is killing their customers. They'd much rather have customers living longer and with more money in their pockets to spend on more profitable items. And at the end of the day, tobacco sales will end, and I think retailers are adjusting to that new reality. We have really effective and active regulatory structures at a regional level through the Northeast Public Protection Partnership, through the Northeast Trading Standards Association, through the regional licensing group, environmental health groups, and linking in with the Association of Directors of Public Health in Northeast and other regional colleagues as well. We have the fresh Tobacco Crime and Regulation Forum, which meets twice throughout the year, and that always stimulates really, really useful and helpful discussions and taking that kind of cross-agency health and enforcement approach. And it's through these structures that, you know, and by working together at that northeast level to make sure that our voice is heard both nationally and internationally in terms of what is needed, reflecting that local to global approach and vice versa. But are there other ways then that we can make this approach even stronger? For example, increased working across boundaries, sharing resources, showing leadership and recognising economies of scale in what is increasingly a backdrop of, of diminishing resources. So I guess back to the original question in terms of what an effective regulatory landscape would look like. And I guess it's about coming back to the fact that we need to make sure that tobacco is the most tightly regulated we need to ensure that the products that are helping people to quit smoking and reduce their tobacco-related harm, that, they're, that those products are accessible and affordable. We need continued advocacy for effective measures around those P's, price, place, promotion, packaging, and product. And we need continued awareness around the challenges that are posed by big tobacco. Um, you know, we can't compete with their budgets. They have really effective corporate social responsibility policies in place, and they will always attempt to influence policy. But we can overcome the challenge we, if we, you know, and stick together. We, we are able to achieve the regulator, regulatory landscape needed if we stick to the evidence base, work together, and at the end of the day, let our voice be heard. So thank you. Thank you.